Well, good morning. We are in a season of Lent, and during this time, as we make our way to the cross, we are going through the book of Esther. And as we've been going through the story, I think you've probably noticed that it can be really hard to know what God is doing, right? Sometimes we're going through a difficult season, and just when we think we're done with it or we're getting out of it, something else falls into our lap. When it rains, it pours, right? In fact, a lot of bad things happen in life, and they don't make any sense. The book of Esther is full of bad things that don't make any sense. Why was a young Jewish slave girl taken to the Persian palace? Why was she made queen? And when her relative saves the king's life, why is another man rewarded? And now that man wants to kill all the Jews? Things go from bad to super bad to worse. That one ray of light is that Esther is on the inside. She's going to be the mediator between the king and the Jews. She's the sympathizer because she is a Jew. So Esther is going to spend a few days in fasting. She's going to go to the king and see if she can get an audience. And even though she hasn't seen the king in a while, and even though there's a probability that the king won't see her, and if he thinks she's too bold in her presentation, there's also the possibility that she could be killed. And when chapter 4 ends, Esther makes this statement, this stand. She says, if I perish, I perish. So the tension for the, our story is as high as it can get. Chapter 5 begins, in the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters. While the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room, opposite the entrance to the palace, and when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you even to the half of my kingdom. Yes! She made it. She's in, right? She, and she didn't die. <laughs> and, and not only does the king allow her into his presence, but he also seems to be giving her the golden ticket right? He says, Esther, it's so good to see you. Whatever you want, just ask. This is Esther's moment. And she says, King, let my people go. No. What she actually says is, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Esther does not say, let my people go. She says, let's have dinner. That was her moment. That was the brass ring. And she says, dinner? But for the reader, you don't even have time to question. The meal takes place in the very next sentence. So it's scene, cut scene, interior, dinner table. And again, uh, at dinner, Xerxes says the same thing. He said, Queen Esther... Whatever you want, up to half my kingdom, anything for you, my love. You know, I tell you, these past couple weeks, we've all hated Xerxes, but now in chapter 5, I mean, this king is really speaking every woman's love language, right? He says, honey, tell me whatever you want and it's yours, right? It is yours. So now, Haman is present. Both of these gentlemen have a couple of drinks in them. Now is the moment, right? And she stands and triumphantly shouts, King, tomorrow I'd like you and Hammond to have dinner with me again. What is going on? The reader is being strung along with a carrot on a stick. Why, why is this happening? Why isn't she taking her opportunity? But interestingly, the next scene is not the next meal. We stay in this day. And the story goes back and returns to Haman. 
Verse 9 says, And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate, and that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king has honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, Even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared, and tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. And this idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. Tell me something. Why did God allow such a foolish man like Haman to have such great power? Haman takes up a lot of real estate in this story, and God, who we'd expect to be in this story, is nowhere. But Haman isn't just a fool, is he? He's not just a fool. No. He's dangerous. Esther keeps putting off what she really wants to tell the king, and all the while, she is just giving Haman more time to execute his dastardly plan, right? So tomorrow, two things are scheduled. Haman is going to impale Mordecai publicly on a 75-foot pole, and Esther is going to make dinner for Haman and King Xerxes. What's going to happen next? It, it feels like a cliffhanger, you know, at the end of one of those black and white cowboy serials, will Esther save the Jews in time? Tune in next week, right? Things are going great for Esther. The king allowed her into the throne room, promises her half the kingdom, and the reader thinks, oh good, things are finally turning around for Esther. But then, dum dum dum, right? The evil villain comes in with his cape and twirling his pencil mustache, and everyone in the audience says, boo, hiss. He's planning to kill Mordecai. Hurry, Esther, save the day. But that's life, isn't it? Sometimes bad things happen, and we don't understand why. And maybe we see the light up ahead, and we think that we're on our way out, but that light is really a train, and, you know, it's, it's worse than we thought. Sometimes things seem so out of control, you wonder if God is even capable of bringing it all back. Chapter 5 is really this cliffhanger. I don't, and I don't think any reader stops at the end of chapter 5. You kind of really do feel like, I have to turn the page to find out what happens next. But chapter 6 is not the next day. Chapter 6 is still the same night. But we've now moved from one scene to another, from one character to another. Now we see King Xerxes. And he sits bolt upright in bed in the middle of the night. He can't sleep. But he doesn't call for a concubine. He doesn't call for a warm glass of milk. Instead, he asks someone to go grab a history book and read it to him. Esther chapter 6, verse 2 says, And it was found, written, how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. Out of all the bedtime stories, on all of the nights, King Xerxes can't sleep, so he calls for someone to read him a bedtime story. And that story that is read to him is the exact story he needs to hear. Coincidence? On the same night that Haman is building a 75-foot pole to kill Mordecai, King Xerxes is learning how Mordecai saved his life. No. Not coincidence. 
providence. Providence means that God lovingly guides all of history, and he's guiding them towards his good purposes, guiding them towards his intentions. Providence refers to the way God works behind the scenes in all of our lives. He orchestrates all of life's events to bring about his plan, his will. True, there's not a lot of big flashy miracles in providence. Rather, it just feels like normal human events. But those normal human events are all under God's control. What appears to be a lot of amazing coincidences, they're not actually coincidences at all. They are by design. King Xerxes says, how was Mordecai rewarded? And his people say, uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't do anything for him. <laughs> and then rather than go back to sleep, Xerxes springs out of bed and he says, we need to fix that. And he runs through the castle and the first person he bumps into is Haman, who's clocking in for work. What luck, what, what coincidence. Haman will know what to do. Verse 6 says, And the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Aha, whom indeed? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Haman thinks that Xerxes wants to reward him. So he says, oh, king, here's what you got to do. You got to give this person gifts, put a crown on their head, make a parade in their honor. And he closes his eyes and he holds out his hands give it to me. And King Xerxes says, that's a great idea. Do all of that for Mordecai the Jew. Our God is the God of great reversals. Isn't he? Isn't he? Can you, can you remember that this morning? When Sarah was 90 years old, God gave her a son. When Abraham was going to sacrifice his son on the altar, God stopped his hand. When Pharaoh had the Israelites building pyramids as slaves, God set them free. And now, instead of seeing his enemy shamed, Haman is forced to dress Mordecai in fine robes, put a crown on his head, and honor him. And it gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. Verse 11 says, So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. So Haman has to guide the horse that his enemy is sitting on, and he has to shout loudly, Hear ye, hear ye. This is the example of those who are loyal to the throne. And then afterwards, Mordecai is feeling pretty good about himself, but Haman goes home worried and ashamed. Our God is the God of great reversals. Did you notice the way the story was heading? You know, as we were, we were reading it, it, the reader is thinking all the while that it's going to be Esther, right? That, that Esther's thing is going to be the thing that saves the day. But somehow, I don't know, call it divine providence, King Xerxes has a troubled night's sleep, and God ends up doing his best work through the two villains of the story. And this is not a normal story, is it? Any one of these events in the Esther story might seem normal when you isolate it, but when you put them all together, when you put them all back to back, it's clear there is another force at work. There is another hero behind the scenes orchestrating all of these events. 
I mean, we're all hoping Esther was going to come through, that she was going to save the day, but deep down we kind of all knew Mordecai really needs a miracle. Esther is a great reminder for us because when it's our turn, when we are in the story, you know, when the events are happening to us and it seems like bad luck to us or it just feels like one darn thing after another, we can remember that like Esther, like Mordecai, we can't see the big picture because we're in the story. But when you read the story, you know, when you step outside of it, even though the character of God is never mentioned, his handiwork is so obvious. How does that help us, though? I mean, for those of us who are still inside the story, well, it reminds us, right, that, that even when we have a hard time seeing God, maybe there's a struggle that you're walking through and it's been something that you've been praying for and it just feels like you're waiting for God to show up and he hasn't. You can't see him. You feel forgotten. Life seems unfair. You can remember that God is working behind the scenes. I mean, it's different when we've got the blueprint, right? When you can read the map, then we're fine. Even if you give me the remote control, if I have the steering wheel, then I have some sort of security. And I don't, I don't mind in those moments putting some trust and faith in God. But most of the time, it seems like I don't know what's going on. And I'm asking my friends or I'm asking my pastor, you know, what do you think? What do you think God is doing in my life? But when we read Esther, God never tells anybody anything. He doesn't explain himself. In fact, nobody in the story knows why anything is happening. In the New Testament, right after the Last Supper, before Jesus makes his way to the garden to pray, before the cross, in John chapter 13, it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. I'm sure this must have shocked Peter to see his teacher bend down and wash his dirty feet. This is a job that a servant would do. But Jesus tells him, right now, in this moment, just trust me. Even though you don't understand what's happening, there's going to be a lot of moments in your story where that's the case. You're not going to know what God is doing. Or it's going to feel like God's not doing anything. And you're going to feel like you should go and ask your friends and ask your pastor. And they're not going to have answers for you either. That's normal. That's the way God designed the world. And it's not just you. It's not just happening to you. It's, it's everyone. Bad things always look bad to the characters that are in the story. In Romans 8, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. I think that 
if we looked at Jesus with that same puzzled expression that Peter has, I think Jesus would give us the same exact answer. He would say, right now, you don't understand, but one day you will. The story of Esther is not something that even unfolds over a couple of days or weeks, not even months. Uh, Biblical scholars estimate that the entire story of Esther is about nine years long. Nine years. Nine years is a long time to wait for God's plan. That's a long time when you're the new queen wondering, why am I here, Lord? What do you want me to do? Our God is the God of great reversals. Look at the story of Jesus. A virgin gives birth. And that child is almost killed by empire. Family flees to Egypt. That child grows up to be 30 years old and then gathers 12 disciples. And then that child begins a religious movement bigger than anything the religious leaders were doing. He heals. He does miracles. He teaches. Crowds gather. And then one day he mounts a donkey and parades through town with a king's reception. And then in one night, a great reversal. He is captured, beaten, judged, killed on a Roman cross, and he is dead. And for those who are in the story, it feels as though the story is over. It's a time of sadness. It's a time of mourning, a time of loss, a time of defeat. It's a time of darkness. Or so we think. And then another great reversal. The king rises from the dead. And now because of that, none of us need to fear death. Jesus has conquered death. He's conquered sin. He's conquered hate. Look, I don't know what you are struggling with this morning. I don't know what parts of your story seem confusing right now. Maybe this is a tough time to find hope. So allow me to give you some hope. God loves you. And he will not leave you alone in your suffering. And he is powerful enough to overcome any obstacle that you are experiencing. If he can mend bone, if he can raise the dead, then he can certainly work out anything that you are going through. He has a plan. Proverbs 3 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. There's a story told about a lady who was boarding a plane headed for Cleveland. And she was waiting for takeoff. And as she settled into her seat, she noticed this very strange phenomenon. On the opposite side of the plane, if she looked through the window, she could see the entire sky lit up orange in a beautiful sunset. But the window right next to her seat, if she looked out of that, the sky was dark and threatening rain. As the plane began to pull forward and go down the runway, a gentle voice began to speak within her. And it said, just look at these windows. Your life, too, will contain both happy, beautiful sunsets, but also dark shadows and rain. But here's the lesson. To save you much heartache and to allow you to abide with peace and joy. It doesn't matter which window you look through because your plane is going to Cleveland. It's the same in life. No matter how things look, eternity with Jesus and heaven, that is where you are going. So you can trust what you see. You can trust God as he directs you and leads you. The God who did not spare his own son is going to keep 
all his promises. You may not see him working, but he is. You may not understand what is happening, but he has a plan. And you may not understand right now, but one day you will. Let's pray. Lord God, patience. I think patience. As we look ahead down the story of our life and we see all the different things that have come and gone, patience pulls us through for this trial that we are experiencing, this heartache, this loss. Faith. Faith also. Trust. To trust in you. To trust your plan. Lord, as I pray and I tell you exactly how to fix things, exactly what I want, exactly how I see things should go, as I relay to you my plans, show you my blueprints, yell at you from the driver's seat, the road that I have taken. Patience, faith, trust. These are the things that are the most difficult to learn. And they are the things that I ask for now. Not my plan, not my will be done, but yours, as it is in heaven. Just give me this day the daily things that I need and continue to guide me away from sin so that I can be your child in all things. I am so grateful that I got to be here today to praise your name, to hear your word, and to share in the love and fellowship of this family. Patience, faith, trust. That's what I want. Help me to follow you all my days. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching and tuning in this morning. Of course, we want to remind you that our church is here in Montgomery, Texas, and we have two services every single week. One at 930, which is our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to have uh, the Lord's Prayer, communion, responsive readings. It's everything you remember about church as you grew up. And then our 11 o'clock service is our contemporary service. We have a band and we're gonna sing worship stanzas and praises. We're also gonna have a program for our kids. So all ages from birth all the way through high school, we've got a program for them at that hour. Please stop by. We would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you next week. Bye.